Thank you for joining our webinar. We'll be starting in just about a minute or so. Thanks. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, Setting the Stage for COP29. My name is Adrian Dolmeister. I'm the Vice President for Global Energy Advisory at ACOM, and I'll be your host for today. We've got a very simple format for the event today. I'm going to talk shortly a little bit about the context setting around COP27. Then I'm going to introduce our wonderful panelists, we're going to throw a few tricky and interesting questions at them, themes around COP29. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll make sure that we try and save about 15 minutes towards the end of the webinar to allow for any questions and, uh, and comments. Please note all the lines are muted, but if you'd like to pop a question or, or share a comment, please use the chat function in WebEx. So let me start firstly with just a little bit of uh, scene setting, add a little bit of color to our conversation. So this is, a, this is an interesting COP. It, it doesn't quite have the hype of previous COPs, and yet there's quite a few important things that will need to be accomplished at this event. It's set against a backdrop of geopolitical complexity. We have major conflicts in the Middle East uh, more recently and since 2022. Uh, in the Ukraine. And what that means is a lot of leaders, heads of state, tend to think more about energy security than perhaps addressing climate change. But having said that, some of you may have seen the recent report by uh, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, in its World Energy Outlook. And the big theme that came across in that report was energy security in, uh, across a number of dimensions. Energy security in terms of access to hydrocarbons, energy security in terms of promoting renewables to diversify away from dependency on hydrocarbons, security around the development of clean energy supply chains. Think of um, those critical elements like copper, lithium to promote the energy transition, and perhaps more saliently and poignantly, uh, energy security in terms of the impact of extreme weather events uh, on energy systems. So very much a, a big theme. Finance is going to be a topic that's going to weave its way throughout this uh, event, and there will be lots of focus on how we can finance responses to, to climate change. And I think that's going to be something that one of our, our panelists will, will go into um, a lot more detail. I think the challenge is significant. You only have to look at the recent report from the United Nations Environmental Panel uh, on the emissions gap report aptly aim. I think it was uh, no more hot air, please. Uh, and and the, the message I took away from that was really twofold. One, the, the volume of greenhouse gases in 2023 were up by around about 1.3%. It doesn't sound a lot, but you need to remember that we have to reduce greenhouse gases by about 7.5% year on year to 2035. So we've got a long way to go. Um, and um, I think also, the message that really resonated with me was, was that we are not on that pathway of 1.5 degrees. With the current policy trajectory now, we're more likely to hit 3.1 degrees by the end of the century. So major, major challenge. But having said that, I think the ambition for this event will be really important. And you have countries already beginning to set that motion, uh, set that in motion before the actual event. South Africa has come out with some comments around how much we need to invest in climate finance, and they're talking about trillions. Uh, and the UK Climate Change Commission has advised the UK that in terms of its own uh, commitment to the NDC, the nationally determined commitment, that we should probably aim for about 81% reduction in emissions by 2035. And I think you need that kind of um, ambition if we're going to be successful in this COP. So we're lucky to have a fantastic panel, a lot of familiar faces here. So I'm just going to work around, briefly introduce you to them, and then we'll, 
we'll dive into some of those themes. So moving around the screen, we have Frank Sweet, who is our global CEO of Environment and Energy. Jennifer Obotino, who's our global energy practice lead. Uh, Farah Naz, uh, fortunate to have her in the UK, but normally based uh, in the Middle East and our director of ESG and innovation in the region. Uh, and uh, the lovely Robert Spencer, as always there for us, very much our man in Colombia, I have to say, and I'll say this now, we may have a few connectivity issues, so Robert might have to go off video uh, so that we can hear his dulcet tones, but Robert, the global head of ESG advisory. So a really great panel. So let's just dive into the meat of this. So I think the first thing I, I talked, and this one's for you, Robert, um, I talked a little bit about what this, this COP is about. I, I did not do it justice, but this term of it's a finance COP, can you talk us through what does that mean? What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? Absolutely, Will Adrian, and, and hi everyone. Good day to you from COP16, Biodiversity COP, where I am in Colombia right now. Um, so yes, uh, Adrian, you're absolutely right. There, there's a lot of expectation around finance for this COP, and that's because it's time for a new finance commitment. So what that's called is the new collective quantified goal, NCQG. Now, if you remember, for the last few COPs, we've still been going back to 2009, I think it was Copenhagen COP, where there had been agreement that 100 billion a year needs to be transferred from uh, developed economies to developing economies based on the premise way back at the beginning of uh, climate COPs that um, the developed countries have created most of the emissions and therefore they should help to pay a contribution to the developing countries who are having to a deal with a lot more of the climate impacts but b haven't really contributed to them as much as they've not been industrialized nations for so long so that's the the basic paradigm and then you've got this uh debate around well how does that finance get transferred is it loans not great and that just increases the debt burden on countries that already are having a challenging time meeting their current debt obligations. And the thing is, the figures are massive, right? So as you as you said, you've already been talking about nationally determined contributions, which is basically the sort of action plan that every country has for how it's going to decarbonize, right? And these get ratcheted up every five years. So next year, in Brazil, in Bel Air, it's a really big one because everyone has to present new NDCs actually by February 2025. So the NDCs are a pretty good indicator. What, what's in the budget of the NDCs for every nation? And it's, it's not enough, right? If, if you took all of the NDCs um, and fully implemented them, you'd get about a 5% reduction by 2030 in emissions, and it needs to be 45%. But then you say to everyone, okay, you've got to increase your emissions. And the developing nations, the poorer countries say, well, how can we do that? That's going to cost us billions of dollars. We can't just magic that money out of thin air. So that is why there's this huge debate on climate finance. And as you say, COP29 has said they want to be the finance COP. So they're trying to build consensus around these mechanisms. And effect effectively, you've got a number of different initiatives that have, have actually kicked off. Um, there's one exciting one, which is sort of a uh, bit of a wild card, which is finally some progress, a bit of a breakthrough on Article 6, which is around um, the ability to trade carbon between countries. So I'll come to that in a second, but just some other things that are going on. So how much finance do we really need? Well, there's a number of different thoughts around that. Um, you could say, well, we need enough finance to... Um, effectively make sure that the costs of climate breakdown aren't realized because we've protected ourselves against them. So there's a sort of hypothecation there. So you know, how much um, how much do we need for that? Well, it's, it's trillions. Um, the, the figures vary in terms of how much uh, climate damage we will sustain through, you know, hurricanes, fires, storms, all these sorts of things. But between now and uh, 2050, you know, there's figures of 300 billion a year up to trillions a year. If you look at the, the data from the 
Uh, Americans, they, they reckon about a trillion a year needs to go into this new collective quantified goal. If you add up all the NDCs, that adds up to about um, 4.5 trillion. And Climate Policy Initiative, which is a, an, an expert group, an NGO policy think tank on climate finance, reckons we need about 6 trillion a year to 2030, and then 7.3 trillion a year to 2050. So it's trillions. This 100 billion a year, which we finally met last year, is now sort of feels like peanuts in terms of the amount of money that's needed. So we are dealing with very, very large figures. And of course, there's all these questions around, well, who comes up with the figures? Is it public money? Is it grants, basically cash transfers? Is it private finance? Or is it some sort of blended finance in between? And of course, as with any um, uh, sort of way of looking at this, you have to sort of develop a few buckets, really. So the way I, I think about it is you've got three buckets. You've got buckets that are going to generate revenue, which is a lot what you were talking about in terms of the energy transition. So that's big projects like wind farms, uh, battery storage, um, all these energy transition projects. You, we're probably looking about four trillion a year investment in them, and they will get revenue back, right? You'll get a return on investment for those. So that's where private finance is really getting attracted because the the fight, you know, the, uh, the the cash flows for uh, renewables projects are looking really good now. You can get returns quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So then you've got your second bucket, which is savings. How do you save from getting that climate impact? So that's government bonds, really, things like that, that put money into huge resilience systems like, you know, big coastal defences, those sorts of things. And you do get private finance coming into those, but by and large, it's it's government that has to be the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the kickstarter there. And then you've got your costs. And this is where the last COP, COP28, had a big breakthrough because they kicked off COP28 with a breakthrough on the loss and damage fund. Yeah. And that's the cost. Yeah. That's what the money goes to for countries who've just been whacked by a climate event. Maybe a typhoon's come through and destroyed part of a city. How do you get fast finance to um, support recovery from that? So that's the loss and damage. That's hit about 700 million within a few days of COP28, but it's sort of petered out. There's not much happening there. And then you've got these um, uh, sort of sort of side event almost um, initiatives. So you've got um, the actual, uh, the Azeri, the hosts, the Azerbaijanis have come up with the Climate Finance Action Fund, uh, CLAF, which is actually an initiative for voluntary contributions from fossil fuel producing countries. And I think that's an interesting idea because I was reading about another another scheme actually it was set up for the um for the english channel originally to compensate for when an oil tanker runs into trouble and you get an oil leak yeah every single port and 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 an and, and oil container puts money into a fund for the um un un unwanted but sometimes happening uh oil disasters and so that you have an immediate cleanup mechanism for that and i think that's a bit like what the Azerbaijanis folk are putting together with this uh, Climate Finance Action Fund. But the thing is, it needs to be a bit stronger, right? If it's voluntary, then people can <laughs> feel yeah. like it, put some money in when they feel like it. But that isn't going to get us to the, the sort of trillions that we need. So there is another thing, the, the Just Energy Transition Partnership, which I think you talked about. South Africa, India, Indonesia, Vietnam and, and Senegal are already in that. Yeah. They're looking for, yeah. you know, 300 to 300 billion or so, I think. So there are these various mechanisms that are coming together. There's going to be a lot of scrutiny on that. Just before I, I finish up my section, I did I did give you a bit of a trail for this Article 6 um, breakthrough that's happened. And so that's Article 6 has been sort of kicking around for, for like a decade. Um, it's this scheme whereby um, countries that are emitting a high amount of, um, of carbon emissions can trade with a country that's been doing really well on their carbon emissions reductions and thereby um, compensate for their lack of progress and, uh, and, and, have a, and have a sort of catch a break, if you like, because they're trading their, their need. So this has been going on. It's a climate finance tool, decades of inaction. Suddenly, we get this breakout group in the, of, the, of the 12 experts who've been working on this. Apparently, Got got a bit, you know, it's got a bit crazy in the in the <laughs> one of the COP pre meetings in October <laughs> during their coffee break. They said, "Like this, let's just do this. Let's just set down the the you know the protocol 
and uh, we'll see see what people think. Actually, it seems to have caught on. Um, so, unless there's any any significant uh, backlash, it, it's it's probably going to sail through because I'm sure the Azerbaijanis, as the hosts, want to have just like COP28 did with the loss and damage fund breakthrough. They'll want to have something good to kick off those first couple of days when all the presidents and kings and the queens are in the room. They'll want to have something good to say. So I think we might get some progress very fast with this carbon trading idea. And of course, that's that's big because carbon trading is actually one way of getting finance into developing countries from yeah. uh, yeah. developed countries that are already starting to decarbonize. OK, not as much as they need to, but they are starting to make some effort and, and get some results. So you are starting to see some results there. And that might result in um, currently the, the, the carbon market is voluntary. It's like a wild west. And, you know, we've seen in the last few years, people have been complaining about the fact that, you know, forests have been paid for with carbon credits. And then you go and look and there's not actually as much forest there as you thought there was. So it's undermined the value of the carbon, the voluntary carbon system. Whereas if, if this formal system gets through, then you'll have a regulated market. Um, you have a, a price that will start to come through. So I'm very excited about that. I think that's one of the things that we'll want to watch closely as COP gets underway. So I'll leave it there. Uh, for now. Take, a, take a pause, Robert. That was great because it is a complex topic and you've unpacked it really nicely. Just a couple of build questions for you. Um, so from memory, that 100 billion a year climate finance pledge originated yep. in 2009, didn't materialize till about 2022. 2023. And even then people debate whether it's actually real because right. there's a lot of loans in there. It's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of loans. And is, okay. that, is, that, so, is that right? You know? so, so Robert, the key, one big question is it took us ages to get that hundred billion commitment. Now we're talking trillions. How realistic is that? Well, I would say that we're all humans, right? And if, if everyone who's going to this COP is a human being, everyone's watching the news, everyone's got families and dependents it feels a bit more existential now and i think that's galvanizing folks what's also happening and this is happening at the cop here as well when i say existential i mean people can see bad stuff happening from the climate yeah. right so we don't yeah, we, we want to do something about it back in 2009 you didn't really see anything beyond normal weather now you do so now people feel it's real they need to be doing something about it whether it's you know changing what kind of car they've got or going to a COP and helping negotiate for outcomes. You know, there's all kinds of different ways in which people contribute. But the finance folks are here at COP16. One thing I'll mention about COP16 is all the big banks, you know, the JP Morgan, the Bank of America, all the big bank HSBC have come to this COP16 biodiversity. And, you know, I can't think of any nature intervention that doesn't give you a climate benefit as well. Where you can get climate interventions which don't necessarily work for nature, but if you're putting money into nature based solutions for climate, you're going to get returns for climate resilience and climate carbon sequestration as well. So it's really encouraging to see everyone from the finance side coming into the nature pop as well. And I think we'll have trickle through into COP29 on the nature side as well, uh, which will result in significant finance flows that then build a, a wider consensus. So it, it is interesting that the, the financial folks are getting their heads around how to um, put money into nature interventions which have climate impacts, beneficial ones. Thank you, Robert. And now I've got another question, but I'm going to come back to that in, in a moment. Um, I'm quite keen, Farah, to bring you into the conversation. Um, we, we hear a lot about this COP being part of a troika. Uh, there was the UAE, which you were at, this event, the Brazil event. Um, just for those who are uninitiated, uninitiated in all the jargon around COPs, what do we mean by Troika and, and why is it important? The whole idea of COP28 was uh, revolved around the global stock take report, connecting back to all the points that Robert mentioned. And that global stock take report when presented to COP28 showed very clearly how we are not meeting the targets. Now also, COPs are about trust, continuity and implementation. And there was a big announcement made by COP28 presidency on Troika, which essentially means a carriage with three horses. And the idea of Troika is to create that trust, continuation and implementation. So the big announcement that took place on loss and damage fund, climate finances and all the pledges and commitments about energy transition and going away from hydrocarbon base uh, to a more renewable base. We want to see that come into reality. 
So the whole idea of Troika is to create a continuity between the pledges and announcement made during COP28 to COP29 in Baku and Brazil. And the idea is to have um, impact, but understanding the level of that impact. I think one of the key important points that Robert touched on is high ambition. How do you how do we quantify high ambition and create a KPI around that and understand how, how well we are doing? So as part of Troika by February 2025, these three countries have to update the NDCs. And that's yeah. quite important because that creates a set KPI and shows us benchmark of where we are going. But also to reach that which was very clearly stated in Global Stock Take report that we need a 43% reduction by 2030 and a 60% by 60 percent by 2035. In order to really meet that target, we really need to understand and update our NDCs and the renewable transition. So I think that's why Troika makes a positive, trustworthy implementation and a continuity. And I think that's the role Troika will be uh, creating an impact and we're really going to looking forward very closely on COP29 how that becomes reality so it's yeah. kind of like uh, giving everybody a bit of idea of what's the idea behind Troika but I think the intention of Troika is very actionable and implementable and so and I'm going I'm going to throw a lot of unfair questions at, at you all so here's one for you Farah um, I, I've heard anecdotally there's quite a few CEOs who won't be going to COP29 uh, anecdotally and, and, and in terms of CEOs of, um, of major investment banks, for example, and it's a finance COP. I hear a lot of excitement about the COP in Brazil, which is next year. Do you think, do you think this COP is going to be overshadowed by what was done in the previous one and the expectation of Brazil? Or do you think it's going to be successful in its own right and why? So, I'm going to pick up on the point that Robert mentioned about the site events and people having those conversations. So I think whether people are meeting at COP or having those site conversations, the key is to have the right minded people and having those conversations, whether that happens in a stage in COP 29 or it happens between different organizations. But the key is to drive that ambition, have those numbers and see what the implementations are like taking these global actions into realistic stage. Um, also, I think having COPs in Baku and Brazil is an opportunity to look at the global and the regional challenges and opportunities because there's a lot of learning that's going to come. Um, and we always like to think global and act local. So those yeah. learnings, I think, is quite important as well. Because if you look at Article 2 of the Paris Agreement, it talks about principles of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities of the countries. And what that essentially means, what a way of transitioning for Global South might look different for Global North. The question is, how do we create a in, in equanimity of all yeah. these different ambitions and transitions? So I think, so I personally think that even though people might decide not to personally go, but the conversation is not going to stop especially in Baku and with Troika and Brazil coming in, said there will be a level of understanding, that there will be a level of a responsibility that would be taken forward. And I really like the point Robert mentioned that we are all humans and we understand this is an existential crisis. I think we are, almost, we are all facing that. So that will create a big transition in our thinking. Nicely articulated. Thank you, Farah. Um, before we shift gears on to another question, I just want to come back to Robert and, and, and Robert, a thick thing yeah. to respond to. I want to give some airtime to some of our on these other topics, but that not just the size, the, the magnitude of the money that needs to be scaled up. The yeah. other thing that strikes me is, is who pays for it. So historically, it was the yeah. developed countries. They were the origin of this issue. There yeah. seems to be a shift now in terms of Pointing the finger is is an inaccurate way, but it's pretty direct in terms of more developed developing countries that are in a more advanced stage that should uh, contribute as well. What's your view on who pays? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I can't remember whether I mentioned it, but I've got it here in my notes that even though the the U.S. is historically the biggest emitter, twenty percent of emissions, if you go back to you know, the industrial revolution, um, China's the biggest emitter now, and the EU has said that they won't want to proceed with the new collective quantified goal 
if China isn't in it contributing as a developed nation. So there is, is quite a lot of horse trading already happening now in terms of those richer developing, I don't know what we call them, uh, China a developing nation, I wouldn't have thought so. But um, you know, the, the economies that are advancing more rapidly. So, you know, the BRIC countries often come up as a group, you know, that Brazil, India, um, South Africa, a couple of others, Russia sometimes gets put in that group. Um, you know, that, their economies yeah. are, are big enough and strong enough, if they're not involved in conflicts, of course, to uh, put money into climate transition, uh, energy transition as well. And so I think that, that question around who pays is going to, A, it's going to involve new folks coming to the table who weren't originally envisaged when, when UNFCCC got started. And it was very clear, right, the advanced nations, Europe, you know, Australia, New Zealand, the Americas, you pay for the developing nations to get their climate uh, work underway. I think that's, that's very dynamic now. I think the other thing is, you know, it comes back to this piece about um, A, private sector, and B, the Article 6 thing. So with the Article 6 piece that I mentioned, you've already got um, uh, dozens of, of deals um, starting to be made in order to do these trades. So that will see a financial flow. And that, as I said, there are these other mechanisms whereby um, climate finance can come with private money investing as well, where there's a potential for a return. So not, not a blank check, not a grant for recovering from you know the latest typhoon. Clearly, that has to be public money. There's no way of getting a return on that for a private investor. But there are returns on the energy transition, on the new technologies, you know, battery storage and grid modernization. These are areas, and I'm sure you're going to get onto this with Frank and, and Jennifer, where you can get that hybrid um, funding and that will see significant flows because there are returns there and there are benefits for the community and the, the, uh, the, the people putting the capital up as well. Okay, fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. Okay, so I think we've got a, obviously there's a lot to cover, but I think we've got a good flavor of some of the big themes around this COP in terms of what the expectations are of what it will focus on. I guess if we fast forward, the question that's bombing around in my mind is, what do we think will be some of the major pledges coming out of this, this COP? I mean, the last COP28, the one that stuck in my mind was the trip, tripling of renewables energy capacity. Um, Frank, another difficult one to forecast what will happen, but what's your take? What do you think are going to be some of the big pledges coming out of this COP? Um, I, I think a key one is going to be a commitment around battery storage in, in all its forms, because without that battery storage, we really can't scale up renewable energy um, to the, to the amount required. So current, um, Global battery storage is maybe somewhere around 300 gigawatts. Um, that needs to go up to about 1500 gigawatts. Um, I think the parties will agree and make those commitments. China, I think, is already requiring, I know is requiring in many cases, that battery storage be paired with new renewable energy projects. They're making that a requirement. And I think it's perfectly sensible for uh, other countries to, to, to do the same thing. Now, the form of battery storage is going to vary a lot. So of that, say, 300 gigawatts, maybe 200 gigawatts is pumped hydro. And there are a lot of pumped hydro projects being, being permitted and built right now. <clears throat> um, we're seeing many of them. We're, we're implementing many of them. Uh, in many cases, it's um, you know, leveraging um, previous mining operations that are at different elevations, and water can be pumped back and forth from different, different elevation points between mines. Um, so I, I, I think you know pumped hydro will continue to scale up, but it, it's not going to be able to scale up fast enough. Basically, we've got to we've got to increase battery storage by about twenty five percent a year to get to that um, fifteen hundred uh, gigawatts, starting from maybe three hundred. Um, so pumped hydro will continue to grow. Uh, the pumped hydro associations claim it's going to be a vast increase, but I think um, more traditional battery storage is more likely. So if you think about the forms of battery storage, you've got pumped hydro, you've got uh, batteries, whether it's lithium ion or lead acid, uh, you've got uh, thermal storage, mechanical storage, and then hydrogen and green hydrogen. And I always used to think about hydrogen as a, as a flammable substance and maybe a fuel, um, but I started to appreciate its value as a battery. Um, so we, I think we'll see more of that. Um, 
The economics, though, I think are really going to favor more traditional batteries, lithium ion, lead acid, um, uh, iron, uh, different different versions. And I think the the, the lithium ion will scale up the scale up the fastest. Um, so with that, though, <clears throat> we are going to need. And, and this goes for any aspect of energy transition. Uh, we're going to need a lot more grid capacity. So I think the IEA estimates uh, about 50 million miles of new grid capacity by 2040, which is just just vast. Mm -hmm. So I think the battery storage is going to come. Um, I, I worry about the the grid modernization. I think with uh, new superconducting cables. Uh, you know, existing corridors can increase their capacity quite a bit, and and no one's going to really mind. But new transition, uh, new transmission lines, uh, I think, are going to be a real problem, particularly if they're cutting across states or provinces or countries that don't benefit from them. And we've certainly seen you know plenty of examples. Uh, we are seeing an increasing number of big, of big grid modernization projects. Uh, you know, in the last year, uh, Adrian, as you're well aware, we won the. Um, National Grid Great Grid Upgrade, which is you know repowering the uh, east side of um, of UK to bring offshore uh, wind energy into market. Uh, that's going to be a big one. Um, we also won Sandio Gas Electric, uh, which is a it's a grid modernization program. Its its real driver is to decrease wildfire risk, but that's a real issue. Um, and and then um, Vic Grid down in Australia is a new one that's going to bring. Uh, offshore wind power in from Gippsland offshore into Melbourne. Uh, same issue there, though. They're going to be coming uh, from the sea across uh, uh, farmland into a metropolitan area. And you can see similar battle lines as we see in the, uh, in the United States. Uh, you've got a more conservative constituency in the, in the rural farming areas that don't want the transmission lines coming across their farm fields. And you've got the um, more progressive, I'll call it, uh, Population center that wants to you know drive that uh, conversion to renewable energy. So I think um, um, I think the battery storage is going to come. Um, I think grid modernization is going to be a bit of a rock fight. I'll leave it there. No, great, Frank. And, and so just for the benefit of our listeners, as you were talking, the, the basics of the jigsaw. If you have that tripling of renewable energy capacity, as you suggested. You need to have the storage because it's an intermittent source of energy, so you need to be able to store it. So that's why it's important. So it's a big enabler. Um, and I think the grid, we talk a lot, we've talked a lot about the grid in, in previous webinars. The grid is the enabler. So, you know, whether it's electric vehicles, uh, electrolyzers for green hydrogen, heat pumps, et cetera, offshore wind, they all need to connect to the grid. So if the grid isn't working, none of this works, right? So you've, you've, you've highlighted why those two are really important. And you, I was interested in your, your latter remarks around, I'm going to paraphrase, kind of local community opposition sometimes to, to, to grids, to pylons being erected and stuff. What, what do you think are some of the, the key issues that, or enablers that would allow storage and grid to take off? Because it's not just a money thing, obviously investments are required, but some other things that are required to enable those technologies. Your thoughts okay. on that, please. Sure. Well, I'll give you... Um... Um, and the answer that that uh, involves a physical response or an engineering solution, and also one that involves policy. So I think microgrids are, are a good solution. So particularly for airports, campuses, uh, yeah. hospital complexes, universities, uh, um, you know, pairing renewable energy with battery storage and a microgrid is is a is a great way to um, implement those three things uh, for. Um, you know, a community that needs it uh, without necessarily having to do complex uh, uh, grid connections and things like that. I mean, you still need those grid connections, but it, it takes the dependency off of it. So I think that's a that's an engineering solution. Uh, the policy solution is one that that involves streamlining the uh, the, the permitting uh, regime. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a quick example. I'm based here in Boston, and our previous governor, uh, Republican governor. Um, did a deal with uh, Quebec to bring hydropower uh, energy from Quebec up in in, um, in Montreal uh, down into Massachusetts to help Massachusetts hit its uh, renewable energy targets. That involved building a transmission line 
across New Hampshire, more specifically across the White Mountain National Park. And the trustees of that park um, didn't approve it. And if you think about it, there was absolutely no benefit to the state of New Hampshire. Um, in, in fact, it was going to degrade a tremendous natural resource and a, a source of uh, tourism and revenue. Um, so I, I, and then locally here in Massachusetts, I, I can see we're doing very well building offshore wind, uh, but the problem starts to become connecting that into the grid. And in the in New England here, we've got a you know town government type format where you you need to get approvals from the local planning board sort of zoning board of approvals, uh, usually a city council or town council. Um, and that, that, uh, you know, that can take uh, six months to a year just in itself in every town that your transmission line goes through. So there is legislation in Massachusetts right now. It's clear the Senate, state Senate, and it's in front of the, um, uh, the congressional body. Uh, we'll take it up, I, I think, a little later this year, which would, um, Put some provisions in place to, to start streamlining that that permitting process. So those are two 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 suggestions. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we're going to shift gears again, um, and I'm keen to bring Farah back into the conversation. So we talked about um, what COP's about. We talked about some of those pledges that may be coming out, kind of forward looking. I want to rewind the clock, Farah. Cast our minds back to some of the big pledges made in COP28. Have they progressed? Have we been successful? Can we declare success? Your thoughts? So, one of the biggest announcement was made about tripling of renewables. So I want to talk a little bit about what's happening around that. So during COP28, Dr. Sultan Al Jaber, the president of COP28 presidency announced tripling of renewables by 2030. Now, the latest IRENA report states that the target of tripling renewables to roughly 11 terawatts will not be met by 2030. Now, the interesting point about that is there's a shortfall of four terawatts. So, yes, there it's, it's a stretch target and uh, globally there's a lot happening. But for me, what I found really interesting is when we were looking at the investment side of it. So, in 2024 alone, 2 trillion US dollar was invested on clean energy and one trillion dollar was invested on fossil fuels, which I think is very positive. Now, I use the word very carefully, but what it shows is the mindset shift and the business as usual is getting shifted. We all understand that there are stretch targets, the transition needs to happen and it needs to happen fast. And Robert and Frank talked about the alignment of the infrastructure as well as the finance. So everything needs to come together and it's a different it's a different way of shifting the business as usual to what's possible and how do we make this transition faster so i think this kind of tripling of renewable targets set even though it's a set target and we talked about the skill sets the grid modernization and all the challenges having said that i think it's really important for us to understand what good looks like and as long as all of the countries are coming together making that focused effort of modernizing the grid and bringing this forward, even though we don't meet the whole 100% target, if we get the 80-90%, I think that shows that the mindset is shifting, the business model is shifting. So I think that's quite positive in terms of going forward. And if we bring in all the conversations that Robert touched on, once there's a bit more clarity on the financing side, I think that's going to come a bit more, it, it's going to become real faster and sooner. Now, I want to touch a little bit about what's happening in UAE. So, UAE was the host country for COP28 last year, and as ACOM, we delivered the carbon management. So, we got to see in depth what's happening with the governance and private and public sector. So, right before the COP28, UAE updated its NDCs. And the biggest update that took place is that they set a very clear target of baseline of 2019 as the baseline year. And they have changed the wording from coal base. They completely take that out and it's completely focused on renewables. So that's very positive. Um, then post COP28 in January of 2024, we launched its first net zero long-term strategy and it's the first net zero long-term strategy in the region, which is extremely positive. 
it gives very clear pathway of what are the scenario analysis of the next 20, 30 years. It provides a very clear diversification methodology that UA government would want to take. And that's very important because that shows that there's a baseline have been thought about where now the infrastructure and the investment needs to align with. And the last part of this policy document is the transparency of the data, how data will be collected, what will be looked at, and how the companies can come forward. Now, as part of that, you have done one additional thing, which I think is very positive, is that the climate responsible companies pledge. So it was an open call across UAE for companies to come forward and create and accept a 20, net zero 2050 pledge. What it does is it shifts the business case, it shifts the conversation. We are all in this together and it's not just the government, it's the government and private and public sector together. And when we talk about collaboration, we always talk about co-creating the future, right? We all mm -hmm. know the mathematics is there, the funding is, we all know where the problems are, but how do you create the ecosystem, the infrastructure drive transformational change? So I think that has been quite positive. The last thing I would like to touch on is the investment. So there is, was a huge investment announcement took place um, and Robert touched on that, that loss and damage fund, US dollar 700 million, uh, 700 million was in, uh, announced, but UAE itself has announced loss and damage fund of US dollar worth of 100 million just for UAE itself, which is very positive and a 54 billion US dollar investment on renewables. So for me, when I look at this, I see a path to least resistance, a path to how the business case and the transition is going to come forward in making mm -hmm. this a real more livable. And last thing I would like to touch on is related to the Article 6, the carbon trade. There's a huge conversation taking place in the Middle East about carbon trading, carbon border management, and carbon taxing, which I which I strongly think is a very positive conversation to happen this happen to this part of the world because it creates a consensus globally and here how do we drive change together and brings together the troika point we mentioned um, about how these three COP countries can take things forward and how globally we can come together to find a solution that of a challenge that we are all facing. So I think um, from a country perspective, these are very positive changes. And what yeah. we would be thinking is a shift of business model, a shift of thinking in the next two to three years as we are getting closer to 2030. Fantastic. Thank you, Farah. Um, by the way, I, I will encourage, um, we've already got a few questions uh, that have been sent in, which I'll come to shortly after we've spoken to Jennifer. But if you've got any questions, please, I encourage you to pop them into the chat. Um, and I did notice someone saying, is this recorded? And the answer is yes, it will. It is being recorded and we'll share the link afterwards. Um, Jennifer, you've been enormously patient. We've had a lot of um, perspectives there about what COP's about, what are the expectations of the future, where have we, where have we made progress with the previous COP, and we, I personally think we saved the best till last. So this, this is very much your world, right? If we take a step back from COP and just look at what's happening around us in the world in terms of, I alluded a little bit to the geopolitics, there's an enormous amount of change going on in energy markets. Um, the IEA, by the way, talked about we're entering a world where, you know, I haven't heard this for ages, kind of ample oil and gas for the medium term in terms of we're not going to have shortfalls there. Um, there's a lot happening there. What are the things that you're seeing in your conversations with clients, your interaction uh, with, with governments, etc. What are you seeing that's interesting and is likely to have an impact on those discussions, shape those discussions at COP29? Well, Adrian, thank you. And thank you all. Um, you just jinxed us by saying that we should have ample oil and gas. <laughs> so, so yeah. I'm just, I'm going to go on record that. <laughs> it's recorded for posterity, right? That's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. <laughs> Um, I wanted to build on a couple things that Farah, Robert, and Frank had all talked about. Um, first is the interconnection and that investment in renewable energy. So, you know, I was at uh, Singapore International Energy Week last week, and the conversation in Asia is is not around how much are we investing in renewables. It's how can we connect, and it's that 
the agreements between the countries for that that interconnection and to have that reliable energy. Um, that part of the discussion also includes natural gas. Um, and, you know, that was part of COP 28 and part of that that transition of, yes, we know the renewables will be online. Yes, we have the continued investment, but it is going to be part of that transition. And then to Robert's point, and I almost was playing bingo because I, he kept saying who pays for it, who pays for it. That is the clear and concise challenge that our clients are seeing and that is part of the discussion. And, and yes, absolutely, the investment in the renewables um, <clears throat> is, is a um, revenue generator. However, in some portions of the world, there's so much renewable energy that it is affecting the ability of the minimum loads on the grid. And so it's it, it's really that balancing act between what is the demand. And so, you know, from the from an energy market perspective and and some of the influences that we're seeing, I, I mean, we can't sit here and, and talk about COP29 or energy without talking about the geo, uh, geopolitics, right? Um, obviously the, We've had three fourths of the world's GDP under election um, in the last yeah. 18 months. We've yeah. got the US election coming up. Um, and we are seeing fluctuation in investments depending on the countries and where they are in the political process on in renewables. We'll continue to see that investment um, once things are stabilized and there's a clear understanding of where, you know, the whoever takes office or whatever that that party looks like um so that could be a positive or it could be a, a bit of a setback depending on um you know the outcomes of some of the elections however that investment will continue um and to frank's point you know as, as far as that grid connection we'll continue to see grid connections um because of just energy security Yep. Um, reliability, the demand continuing to um, just increase, uh, you know, just magnify, um, and especially from from data center demand, um, yeah. and you know how we can look at that that demand and you know what a tax that puts on our um, our existing system and how we can help our clients to maybe reduce um, some of that demand just by some of the design and layout. And then of course, I, I can't talk about energy and not talk about uh, nuclear. And, yep. um, you know, the surgence in nuclear and that interest in nuclear, um, we know that China is, is, is doubling down on nuclear. And, you know, that, that's because it is a, a cleaner energy source um, especially with some of the smaller modu small modular nuclear reactors where it is a, there's more flexibility. Now, it's not the answer to everything, but it's another tool in, in the toolbox as far as yep. to address energy demand going forward and to transition into a more renewable green energy source to meet our goals. Fantastic. You, you covered a lot. Um, just before we take on some of the questions from the audience, can you just go a level deeper? Because I know you're doing a lot uh, with data centers, particularly in the US, in terms of the surging demand there in a short space of time, the interest in nuclear. Just maybe give our colleagues on the line a flavor of what we're seeing in the market and the different perspectives between the data centers, energy companies, investors. Give Absolutely. Us a flavor, yes. Us. Yes. So, so our our clients that are investing in data centers, um, you know, what they over the last eighteen to twenty four months, when they were looking at locations to invest to build a data center, it was all about the location. Where is the geography, the physical geography of the the data center? Now it's all about the energy capacity and can can there is there reliable resilient, consistent energy that can be supplied. What we're hearing from some of our utility clients and just from a, a global perspective is, no, there's not. 
because when they're when the utilities are planning out and forecasting their demands they're forecasting out 20 years and not having these surgeons and so you know again that's like th that's why there's then this renewed interest in, and frank had talked about microgrids um of you know can we it, are there opportunities to use solar or onshore or offshore wind nuclear hydropower and um Frank, when we were in, I was, when I was in Australia, and I, I'm sure you had the same conversations as far as converting some of the, the mines to um, hydropower plants and locating the data centers next to those. So that, that, that's the other, you know, aspect of thinking about the location of where data centers are. And we are so focused on data centers right now, but we know going forward, it's not just data centers, it's all of the consumers of that data also. So it, we know the demand is going to continue to um, increase. Nicely put. Um, I mean, data centers seem to be in the news all the time and you, and mm -hmm. you covered that. And I think the last remark you made for me is probably one of the most important remarks, which is it, there's clearly, it's an important source of demand growth but compared to other sources, electrification of vehicles, for example, heat pumps, um, the demand for energy is gonna be far greater than data centers. I think the IEA talks about overall between now and 2030, it's about 10%. Um, the other sectors are bigger, but it's one that's in the news a lot. Thank you. Um, I know that we're running out of time. So I think we've got about five to six minutes. So I'm just gonna go through some of the questions that have come in. I'm gonna flick them out to individuals, and if others want to build on it, please. Um, so I've got one here, inevitably, US presidential election. Will the outcome of the US presidential election have a significant impact on COP29? Frank, as, as a US resident, I'm going to throw that first at you. Well, I don't know if it's going to have much of an impact on COP29. I think it might have an impact on uh, US energy policy going forward. Um, so I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it can have much of an impact on COP twenty nine. You know, it's not going to change who's attending. Um, it might change some of the dynamics amongst the parties. Um, and do you, and, and maybe Jennifer, do you think you know last time round when Trump pulled out of Paris, that was quite a, that was quite a major announcement. Then, mm -hmm. you know, if if we see the U.S extricate, isolate itself from these climate change <clears throat> policies. Is that something that we think is going to slow down the overall momentum or actually things happen at the state level, irrespective of what happens at the federal level? So I think, it, it, and to Frank's point, it's not just energy, but it's environment, right? Um, depending on what happens in, in the White House, but also in both the, the House and Senate too. Um, so if, if there is a change in party, um, you know, who knows exactly, you know, we don't have that crystal ball, but what we can expect is that the states, especially states as, as Robert had indicated, and he had to drop, but um, as Robert indicated, the states that are, have been so heavily impacted by extreme weather events are going to continue to invest and the expectation is there. Also, as we talked about with, with data centers or just private investment, that it, that money is going to continue to be there because shareholders expect it, because the public expects it, and because in order to be able to meet the demands of their energy needs, they're going to have to continue to invest. So I, I think as, as a country, there'll be fluctuations, and, and we're already seeing that, right? Um, however, once, um, you know, the election is, is agreed upon and final, um, yeah. you know, we'll know, um, we'll have a better feel for, you know, some of the funding that's in place now that is, um, focused on some of the renewable energies in particular, um, through DOE. Um, but I, I think the public and, and private investment will continue to drive it. It may just not be at the same rate as what we've seen, um, in the, in the, with previous administrations. Yeah, and I, I agree with that, Adrian. Um, and just to clarify, the reason I, I don't think that a change that the presidential election will have a significant outcome on COP29 is that the same administration will be in place throughout COP29 
and in, in right into the, the next calendar year. So that's not going to change right away. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and, and thanks for reminding us, Jennifer. Yeah. Apologies. Um, Robert had to be pulled away on, on a client engagement. So we were lucky to get him for most of the show. Um, Farah, one for you. Tricky one, this one. Um, are we likely to see progress on the commitment to transition away from fossil fuels? It's a very tricky one. <laughs> I think lucky you. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I work in UAE. You always get this question. <laughs> I think the focus is shifting the business case. It's not going to happen overnight. And the idea is that what are the other sources of opportunities out there in the Middle East. It is one of the biggest hydrocarbon producing state and it, it's been quite a long time. And the idea is that how do we start transitioning out? So that's why I'm saying that uh, it's not going to happen overnight, but having the right policies, having the right investment and transparencies and global and local carbon taxes and carbon management thing will play a key role in shifting the business case. And I also want to add this one point about grid infrastructure uh, improvement and aligning with investments. Yep. Currently, this is what we are seeing globally, and this is what we are seeing tremendously in Saudi Arabia and UAE. And this is what we would like to see for next three, four years, is how the grid infrastructure is getting ready for taking all these renewables and implementing into the grid. And I think that um, systems thinking approach is extremely important. There is a huge drive right now looking at the industry sector, and I think it aligns very well with the climate policy that came in, signing all the SMEs to sign up for these commitments. So there is an awareness and education important. Policies is important, transparency is important, and then also trying to identify what's the best way to align the investments with all these infrastructure improvement that requires to make this transition happen. So it is in progress and I am positive. I am an optimist to see that it will have a huge transition and positive impact in the Middle East in the next three to five years. So Adrian, can I add to that just really yeah. quickly? Yes. Um, so Farah, um, so I, if anybody that's on the, the or that's participating was at Singapore International Energy Week last week, there was a speaker from the Middle East and he just said energy transition's not happening. <laughs> okay. Um, and so it was interesting because it was kind of a, you know, a, just a slap in the face. However, it got so much conversation and and really thinking about well, what does he mean by that, right? And and there is still, like you said, there has to be a balance. And it was a very impactful statement. However, it also started tremendous conversation, which is exactly what we've talked about. You know, the, the meaning of what COP29 is, is the conversation and then the commitment. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, it wasn't a, nece a negative thing that he said. It was just a perspective on on how things are progressing and, um, you know, where, where we need to, to do more work. Thank you for sharing that. I think these are the type of provocations we need across the world in the Middle East to say, okay, it's not going to happen. Okay. Then the question is, how do we make it happen? Right. Yeah. All right. Agreed. Um, I'm going to have to, to, to kind of draw it to a close now. I have to say, uh, thank God we've got Jennifer. And then Farah there were three, still, right? <laughs> still standing because I feel like I'm the moderator of death. We've had panelists just disappearing from the screen. Um, but obviously client engagement. So we're always juggling this thing. So thank you very much, Jennifer and Farah, mm -hmm. for holding out with me. Um, I know there are still some more questions coming in. Apologies. I, I'm keen to wrap this up in a timely way and I, and I hate rushing. Uh, the conversation. So let me let me just wrap it up. Um, I, I am not going to do justice to the themes that have been discussed, but there were a few things that um, were said that resonated with me. I think Robert's comments around the human angle and the existential angle. At the end of the day, we will drive the change. Um, I like Farah's comments around trust and, and high ambition and the fact that just having a forum for discussion is really important whether we're physically there or not. I think Jennifer's comments uh, of the quote, energy transition is not happening, 
is all part of the narrative that we have to keep on engaging different stakeholders uh, and moving uh, in the right direction. And I think different regions are at different stages of evolution uh, with regards to energy transition. Um, and I think the, 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 the final point is, it's not for lack of money that we can't change. I think there is a significant amount of capital out there that can be deployed. It's the mechanisms that how we use policy, how we use the art of persuasion to, to manifest that change. So um, I hope this will be a very successful COP and one, one to follow. I'd like to thank our panelists, those remaining and those who've had to disappear off into the sunset. Thank you, you've been great, absolutely fantastic. Always engaging to hear you all speak. I learned a lot and I know our listeners will. Um, a big thank you to all of the attendees who made, took the time out of their busy diaries to tune in. Thank you for that. We'll, put, um, we'll share the link to the recording with all those who attended. For those of you who received that, please share that with colleagues. Um, and we'll do a, a LinkedIn social media post to advertise this. Um, if you've got any questions, please come back to us um, and we'll advertise future events. And with that, I will give you all a very big thank you. Have a wonderful and safe rest of day. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye.